I'm Caitlin Collins. I'm one of the co-editor-in-chiefs of The Manor, which is Fairfield's yearbook, and the other co-editors, Rebecca. And we created this event because this year at Fairfield, it's the 50th anniversary of women. And so we invited some of our past female editor-in-chiefs to come speak and talk about their experiences at Fairfield. So here's Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca. Um... Yeah, so we're just gonna get rolling, I guess. So um, today we have Susan, Megan, and Julia who were all kind enough to join us. And uh, we can just, you know, start with um, each of you want to say a little bit about yourselves, tell us, you know, where you are now a little bit. Um, and yeah, so Susan, do you want to start? Sure. I'm Susan Kuhn Howard, and I am a psychotherapist. And I'm in private practice, and I've been doing that for about 37 years. Uh, after I left Fairfield, I went to UConn School of Social Work and got an MSW and have been working in that field ever since. I live in Southington, Connecticut with my husband. I have two grown children and three grandchildren. And um, I guess that's uh, a synopsis. Awesome. Um, thank you. Megan, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. So I'm Megan Amato. My maiden name is Halt, and I um, live in Norwalk, Connecticut with my husband and my two kids. They're, they're toddlers, um, a boy and a girl. And I graduated from Fairfield in 2005. So um, 15 years I've been an accountant. And um, even more recently, I actually uh, am a book lady. So kind of going back to my yearbook roots, but on the side, I do sell children's books now. So it's just kind of like a fun little hob and jobby for me. Um, but I'm actually originally from Seattle, Washington, and I um, came to Fairfield and then I guess I just never left Connecticut. So, you know, I'm really down the street. So, um, but I, I worked in public accounting for, about seven years and then I worked for Avon and most people know Avon and you know the ladies who sell door to door. <laughs> um, and then more recently, the last two years I've been working at PDC Brands, which is um, a small consumer products company and we sell um, beauty products and um, Epsom salt. So a bunch of bath and fragrance type of things. So, but I've been doing accounting and finance um, my whole career. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Julia. Hi, I'm Julia. Um, uh, my, uh, I guess my maiden name that I graduated in 2005 with was Messina. Um, I'm now married to my husband, Jonathan Burns, who is also a graduate of the class of 2019. Um, since, or class of 2009, sorry. Um, uh, so yeah, I graduated in 2009 and um, since then, I have completed um, medical school um, uh, at Albany Medical College, and now I am a physician um, at Mount Sinai Hospital um, with a specialty in geriatrics. And my husband and I are currently living um, in New York City. Awesome. Um, cool. So our first question, besides a little bit of background about you, is what, what drew you to the manor? And uh, Julia, since you just spoke, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, so uh, I was initially drawn to work for, or get involved with the manor because I had been involved in the creation of my middle school and high school yearbooks. Um, so it was kind of just a natural <laughs> kind of progression when I came to Fairfield. Um, so it was also something kind of like a nice break from my um, academic life um, and particularly an academic life that focused on science. I was a biology major at Fairfield. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a little bit more creative <laughs> um, for me. I also really enjoy photography. So um, it was a pretty natural uh, fit and pro progression for me and to continue to work on yearbooks and publications um, in my college career. Great. Uh, Megan, do you want to tell us a little bit about what drew you to the manor? 
Sure. I, I think I also was thinking, you know, looking for something to do that was outside of just academics. And I was in the business school studying accounting from really day one. Um, but, you know, growing up, I, I really was like, my career aspiration was to be an author, a writer of some sort. So this, I felt like kind of balanced out <laughs> uh, the career I was going to be taking to a little bit more of my creative side. Um, I had actually never done the yearbook in high school or middle school. I think I was just maybe too busy with sports and other things at the time. Um, and so I joined right in when I was a freshman, got some of my friends to, to come as well. And um, yeah, I, I've always liked like stuff looking, writing, you know, doing things like with pictures and cropping them stuff. So um, it was it was appealing to me. Fantastic. And Susan? Well, I have to say I was not drawn to the manor. The manor was drawn to me. What wound up happening is, um, I didn't mention this in my introduction, but I was in the first class that women were accepted for the full four years. And um, when we got to campus, all of the student activities were defunct because there had been a strike and part of the, what happened as a result was all the student activities were canceled. So the uh, publisher's representative knew me from having just done my high school yearbook. I was the literary editor. And um, he and the director of uh, alumni relations, who was the um, faculty advisor, uh, came to me and asked me if I would help. So I did. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm not one to um, say no to a challenge. And I had entered saying I wasn't going to do the yearbook my freshman year because I wanted to um, focus on my academics. But when asked, I said, well, yes, I will do that. And then once I was the um, co-editor my freshman year, which was hard to do because I didn't know anybody, but you get to know people as you do it. Then the following three years, um, I was asked to do it again. And we came in with absolutely no budget. So we had to, you know, find money to, to put the book out. And a lot of people were um, a little dismayed at the final product because it wasn't fancy dancy at all because we weren't able to use color. We weren't able to use some of the things at the time that made it so much more costly, but we put together a book. So for our next question, we're gonna talk about what did you like most about being an editor and working on the manor? So Julia, what did you like best about being an editor? Um. There are a few things I really enjoyed about it. Um, one of which in particular in my senior year was that I was able to kind of chronicle and document, um, you know, our four years at Fairfield, which were very memorable for me and my group of friends. Um, so it was really nice to have that op opportunity to document and kind of highlight you know, everything that we've done for the past four years, kind of put it, you know, to paper, literally. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of my friends, you know, involved with the, you know, production of the yearbook as well. So it was a nice activity for us to do together. Um, and um, additionally, I had a really nice office in the <laughs> BCC, which was nice. Um, so that was a nice perk. But I think really just the opportunity to kind of document, you know, really for memorable years at Fairfield was um, probably the highlight for me, especially in my senior year, um, especially with senior week. And, you know, that's a large part of the, the yearbook. Um, so that was that was really great for me. I, I really liked that part. Um, Megan, what did you like best about being an editor? Yeah, I Julia said it pretty well to documenting, you know, your life at Fairfield. Um, it probably also made me like go to a couple more things than I normally would have um, that aren't like of my normal interest. But, you know, and then if I missed the event, I got kind of caught up by, you know, 
reading about it and putting together the article um, that might have gone into the yearbook on it. But um, there were a lot of crazy things that happened when I was at Fairfield. I was, you know, my sixth day, I think, um, at the school is when 9-11 happened. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, like a couple other scares, like bomb scare. And, and so it was quite an eventful year, just my freshman year. And I was involved then and got to help, you know, put together the stories that wrapped it all up into, you know, a page. And those are very um, big things that will sit with people their whole lives, you know. So I'm glad I got a part of putting that together into the yearbook. But, but definitely senior year was a fun one to do. Um, and, you know, I got I had people reaching out to me and got to know a couple of people just because they knew I was the yearbook editor and I could get them into the yearbook at their friends thing because that's what everybody wants, their faces yep. there. Um, and it was the best I could do to not put me and my friends in all the pictures. But, um, you know, you do what, what you got to do um, to, to get enough coverage in there of everything. So um, I did really like the office as well because the, um, you know, Campus Center was it was all brand new when I started as well. And so that office um, also kind of was like my study area sometimes if I had to get out of my dorm room. Um, I preferred it over the library. So I don't know, I, I spent a lot of time in that office. <laughs> Where was the, you guys keep talking about an office. Where was the office? It's the ground floor of the campus center. So, um, you know, the big glass building. <laughs> um yeah, in the middle have an it was there was like a fusta office down there um yeah okay it was probably where the radio is now okay and above there. us was like the mailboxes and yeah. um the bookstore was up there but i'm not sure i know the bookstore is now primarily in town so i'm not sure if it's maybe yeah. it's still in the campus center too yeah our office i think it was between basically where their mirror was located and where the radio is um on the lower level of the bcc um yeah. and um yeah i agree i studied there a lot you know it was a nice like hub i lived off campus my senior year so it was a nice hub for me on campus and then also just a place like where people would just come and stop by because it was all glass um so a lot of people would just come by and say hi and i could see people so yeah that was that was a a big perk <laughs> you guys don't have an office <laughs> no. thank you Susan what did you like best about being an editor um, I think getting to know people you know I, I got to know way more people in that role than I would have if I didn't have that role so I think that was um, important getting to know all the things that were going on on campus you know that was before computers. So we didn't have all of the things you have that, you know, all you have to do is, you know, log on and you see everything that's going on. We found out a lot of things uh, through the campus newspaper or word of mouth or posters hanging up or whatever. So lots of times I got to know things before they were advertised in those ways. So that was kind of fun. Um, also being able to uh, put a spin on the year. You know, it was, um, you know, we worked as a group to do that, but I got final say in that and I kind of like that. Um, fantastic. Uh, so shifting away a little bit from specifically stuff about the manor, uh, we wanted to ask you what advice do you have for students concerning life at Fairfield? So this is just like anything from res life to going to stuff on campus. What advice would you give them? And Susan, I'm gonna give the mic to you first. Okay, this probably sounds like what all, all old people say, <laughs> but don't waste it. You know, there's so many opportunities at Fairfield now. I always say to my friends that I went to Fairfield with, if they had then what they have now, none of us would have graduated because we would have been doing all these, you know, fun activities and, you know, um, playing with the computers and this and that. But don't waste it. Um, and don't neglect some of the aspects of your life that it's easy to neglect when you're focused on your academics, like service, like spiritual life. Um, and there's so much there available to help you with those things. So that's my advice. 
Awesome. Um, and just because you mentioned service and spiritual life, were you involved in any of that on campus yourself? Well, <laughs> yes. Um, I forget what it was called, but there was a, um, a service organization to go into Bridgeport and help tutor kids. I was involved in that. Incredible. Um, oh, I'm trying to think what else. I didn't think about this. Um, <laughs> as far as the spiritual life, the chapel was in the basement of Loyola. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, we were there the year after it was mandatory to go to mass every week. And it was like a pendulum swing to the other side where most students did not go. Mm -hmm. I was one who did because I always valued my Catholic um, self. But it was um, a little harder to find um, that aspect at that time. Awesome, thank you. Uh, uh, Megan, what advice would you give to students concerning life at Fairfield? Yeah, well, I would say definitely go out of your comfort zone. You, you're not the same, you're not gonna be the same person when you graduate that you are when you start your freshman year. So it's kind of a good time to define yourself. Um, you know, try all kinds of new things. I definitely did. Um, you know, studying is important and doing well in school, but like definitely make friends. <laughs> so hopefully you guys are all able to do that. It's, you know, some of my um, closest friends now are my friends I met at Fairfield. So, and they're just a big part of my life. They've helped shape me. So, um, you know, and take advantage of all the things that are offered at you at school. Um, I, I took a like weekend trip to Indianapolis once with one of my accounting professors and two other girls to compete in this competition. <laughs> Sounds a little bit uh, dorky maybe, but you know, it was fun experience. I got to see, you know, the Speedway, um, but you know, Fairfield has a lot to offer. Um, you know, I, I used to go to the concerts that were on campus. I would do, um, I did some FUSA events and then, um, if you have the opportunity to study abroad, because Fairfield has amazing programs, definitely do that too. And that opens your um, your eyes up to so many great experiences. So I did the Florence program. Um, so if you guys can do that, do it. <laughs> it's like you read my mind, Megan. I was going to ask you where you studied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was dying to go to Florence as soon as I heard about it when I started. So <laughs> did it. It was amazing. My junior year. Spring or fall? I did the spring. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Julia, if you had, um, what advice do you have for students concerning life at Fairfield? Yeah, so I think I'll pretty much echo what Susan and Megan were saying is that definitely take advantage. I know it may be a little bit more challenging these days with COVID, you know, to take advantage of all the stuff that's going on um, at Fairfield outside of academics. Um, but I do think that's a huge, huge part of what college life is about. You know, yes, your academics, again, are really important in terms of, you know, careers afterwards and what happens afterwards. Um, but I think, like Susan and Megan were saying, also the friendships that you make at Fairfield are extremely formative, um, at least for me, they have been. And just like Megan said, you know, a lot of my Fairfield friends are still some of my closest friends. Um, at my husband and I's wedding, it was the vast majority of people there were from Fairfield. <laughs> they outnumbered our family. Um, so Fairfield is like our family. Um, so I really, really encourage people if they are able to, even like with COVID, to go out, explore the other things outside of academics. If you can get out of your dorm room <laughs> um, and explore and meet new people. And, um, you know, there's also you know, your professors are really approachable. You're really lucky to go to a relatively small um, school. Um, I know, again, COVID makes it a little bit different these days, but, you know, your professors are really there for you and available to you if you need it. Um, I've had some, I had some great mentors while I was there. So um, always take care, take advantage of that, especially when looking for jobs or anything afterwards, they can be a great resource to you. Um, Megan can probably attest to that in the business school more than I can. Um, so yeah, really 
you know, take the opportunity, take advantage of like the beautiful area too. Um, Fairfield is a beautiful place too um, that we miss. Um, so yeah, just make the most of it with the warm weather if you can. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Um, I have to say, I really like what you just said about professors, because I, I think a lot of students don't necessarily take advantage of the professors who are there. Like, um, I'm close with several of my psychology professors and they've written me letters of recommendation left and right because of it. So I think that's fantastic advice. That, um, and I'm really glad that you said that. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about life after college. So Susan, what advice do you have for students after Fairfield and the adjustment from like college to the real world? Well, I think it's important to have a focus, you know, to know what you want to do next. Not necessarily exactly, because I don't think it hardly ever works where you say, okay, I'm going to do X and X happens and is a straight line. It's usually, you know, life, God, the universe come together and push you in a direction somewhere. Um, I always tell the story of when I was a senior at Fairfield, I was a research assistant to um, a social psychologist, Professor Dorothea Berginski, and she was uh, on sabbatical now picture this, your research assistant to someone who's on sabbatical, they're not there. So she would call in and have me do certain things or whatever, and I did them. And so right before graduation, she came on campus and she said to me, so what are you gonna do next year? And I said, well, I applied for PhD programs. And she said, but what do you wanna do? And I said, I was kind of taken aback because I never really thought about it. I was just on this um, train going to get a PhD in clinical psych, but never thought about why. I mean, it sounds like I was um, not a thoughtful person, which isn't true, but it's just the train I got on. So she asked me and I said, well, I guess the answer to that question is I want to help people. So she said, you know, you can do that with a PhD in clinical psych, but you're more likely to be able to do that with an MSW. And it was the first time I heard about that. We discussed it, whatever. And I feel like she helped guide my direction because she was right in what she was saying about what that had to offer versus what a clinical psych degree had to offer. And I switched gears right then and there. Okay, fast forward after I got out of grad school, and I said, there were two things I was not going to do. I wasn't going to work with drug addicts and I wasn't going to work with alcoholics. Now, I know now and have known for many years, it was because I was afraid of it. And um, so in those days, the way you got a job is you opened up the newspaper and looked and see what was available with your credentials. So there was one job available with my credentials. And it was for a drug and alcohol specialist. I got the job. I loved the job. And the job was exactly what I needed to do to get me where I eventually wanted to go, which was to be in private practice. So I feel like, you know, stay open to the opportunities, even if it's not what you think is going to be the best thing for you because you will be guided somehow by life. And um, that's my best advice for after school. Stay open to the possibilities. Don't tell yourself, no, I'm not gonna do that because maybe that's exactly what you need to do. Thank you for that. Megan, what's your, life, what's your advice for life after Fairfield? I love Susan. So I'm just trying to think on, an, on, an, on another thing about life after Fair, Fairfield is, you know, you're, you're going to have your career, you're becoming an adult, you're independent for the first time, you're going to be paying rent, you're going to be doing all these things that you, you may still be having fun and acting like you're in college. That definitely happened a lot in the beginning, you know, you're 22, 23 years old. Um, 
and not much tying you down, but you're going to be focused on your career. But don't forget about kind of the other parts of your life, you know, keeping in touch with your family and your friends that may not be working with you because you're not going to see them as much anymore. Um, you know, you're not going to have them next door all the time like you used to be. But keep in touch with them and other alumni um, by going to the events or, you know, just making time in your life. Um, but also always put yourself and not just your job as high importance because um, I know one thing I didn't do is, you know, stay active. I worked and worked and worked and worked in public accounting at the beginning a lot of hours, um, probably more than I thought I would. And, um, you know, but, you know, take the time to do your hobbies if it's going to the gym or just finding something else that you really love instead of just your job, because it's not the only thing that defines you in life. So I would say it's taken me many years to figure that out. Um, probably having kids was the thing that finally reset m my life a little bit to, to think about those other things. So um, it's, it's just, it's really important. So um, yeah, I think that's just another thing to add on to what, what Susan said. Thank you. Julia, last but not least, but what's your advice for life after Fairfield? Um, I agree with everything um, Susan and Megan said, and I'll kind of, I guess, speak to a little bit more uniquely about my career path. My career path has been quite long um, to get to become a physician. It's been a lot of, you know, postgraduate training and so forth. Um, so um, kind of along the same lines as what Susan and Megan were saying that, you know, even if the road to like the quote unquote ideal job seems long and hard, um, you know, stick with it. Um, again, it may not be that perfect, again, linear path that you were hoping for. There may be lots of bumps in the road, unexpected delays, you know, whether it's for personal or whatever reasons, you know, things happen. Um, not to get discouraged by that, to kind of, if you really have a clear sense of what you want to do and that goal, um, to keep working towards it. Um, you know, life is very, very uncertain. And I think just remain open um, as well to um, various experiences um, or various job opportunities or life experiences that you may not think are, may be that great or that helpful, but please stay open to them, try them at least for a little bit and see, um, they can turn out to be, you know, some of the most helpful and formative things for you. Um, and I think that's really, really important. So um, even if the path to whatever goal you have after college is not perfect, um, just realize it eventually comes, you eventually get there. Um, don't be discouraged and keep working towards it. And again, as what I think what Megan said is also just very, really important, you know, rely on your family um, and those who support you and are with you. Um, your friends from Fairfield will likely be part of, or hopefully will be part of that support system for you. So really relying on them, I think is a, a huge thing as well. So um, yeah, and you can always go back to the Fairfield community if there's something, you know, <laughs> um, career wise, you know, go back to the people that helped you um, during your time at Fairfield, they're very open to that. The Alumni Association is helpful with that as well. Um, so don't, for, don't forget about that. <laughs> Great, okay, so our next question kind of takes the best of both worlds. It involves being editor, but it also involves life after Fairfield. So it's how do the skills you learned while being editor of the manor help you in your career today? And um, Megan, do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, you know, I, I would say being editor helped me manage a team, um, even some who are friends, and that can be hard to try to um, make sure that your friends are doing and staying on task. Um, and, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of, you know, tight deadlines while working on the manner, especially towards the end when I was trying to wrap up everything Fairfield and you're trying to get your yearbook out and not have it drag on. Um, but so as an accountant now, you think I'm mainly just doing numbers and stuff, but you know, I, oh, I have some books here too, but so uh, these are kind of like yearbooks, right? So what I did at Avon was financial reporting. So 
you're reporting on the financials of the year and the quarter. Um, and you get some actually pretty books, definitely not as interesting as our yearbook, but um, very important things that go out. So I did use some of my writing skills um, and editing skills from the yearbook to, to put those things together. Um, I have to do some more yearbooks here too, guys. So this is mine. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I would say that even now on this new side job I have, I get to work with graphics again a little bit, like I, I talk about books and, and summarizing them for um, people that want to buy books for their children and, and it's pretty cool because I remember really liking the programs that I would use and I'm putting the yearbook together you know with these hand pictures and cropping them and, and I'm kind of doing some of that now so you may use those skills again in your job even if you're not doing anything that seems like it's a yearbook um, you know I'm not I'm not a writer but I definitely am using those skills but um, I would say that the team management um, was a big one for me because I have managed some teams, you know, um, throughout my career and, and, you know, I really never acted as a leader in high school. I was always more of an introvert and didn't really take the plunge of doing things like this. So uh, somehow I became editor and uh, I was driven and I, it helped me learn how to lead other people. Awesome. Thank you. Julia, do you want to speak to what skills you've learned that's helped you in your career today? Yeah, I would agree. Um, I mean, definitely having a prominent role in the yearbook, being an editor, um, is super great in terms of developing leadership skills, which I think are important in what, no matter what career you go into. And, um, you know, learning how to, you know, manage a team, like Megan was saying, and um, also just the, the process of like having an ultimate goal of producing something and seeing something through to the end, what I think was really, really important. Um, Cause it really is a labor of love to put like a, a whole book together. You start off with like, you know, just a couple things, you know, a few pictures, a few pieces of text and you really have to, you know, work on it for months. Um, and it takes a lot of time and effort. And I think really that process of like, this, as I call it, labor of love, where you have to do, work on something for a very prolonged period of time. And you're like, oh, when is this going to end? Like, when am I going to see the final product? And you don't, you don't see the final product immediately. It's, you know, like a year later. Um, so I think really um, that kind of perseverance towards a goal, um, I think was really, really important for me. Um, even though you may not have that instant gratification when you're doing something, you know, as it's a little bit more of a delayed gratification. I think that was really important for me in terms of, you know, my career path and so forth, um, that that was really, really um, valuable. Um, so yeah, not everything is instantaneous, but when it does happen and when it is finished, it's, it's really great and super rewarding. Awesome. So would you say, just cause I'm um, thinking about what you just said about delayed gratification, would you say that's something you learned from doing the yearbook and that's, kind of helped you get through all this schooling you've had to do to get where you are today? Yeah, it's been a lot of, a lot of delayed gratification in terms of my career. Um, you know, going through four years of college, you know, there's delayed gratification with that. You have to go through it for four years before you get your degree, you get your first job or your first internship. If you pursue, you know, postgraduate education, you have to usually do that for at least a couple of years and then you finally get that. So I think it's, it just teaches you also about you know, personal things, you know, you may not have like the fanciest car, or the fanciest apartment or the be the first person to buy a house, you know, in your group of friends, but that's okay. You know, like you just, if you keep working at it slowly and chipping away at it slowly, I think that's, um, that was a good lesson for me um, and something that I've carried through for multiple aspects of my life. So, um, so yeah, learning to kind of take the reins back and say, hey, it's okay if I don't have like that immediate gratification, it will come eventually. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Susan. Well, for me, I think um, I definitely agree with Megan and Julia and the things they said. But for me, it was more, um, I learned not to be intimidated by uh, lots of things. Like one example is going into New York City to the publisher's office and talking to what I thought at the time were these big publishers. And, um, you know, I grew up some 
in the process of having to deal with um, all of that. Also, so not to be intimidated by some of the things I hadn't done yet or some of the kinds of people I hadn't interacted with. I think definitely cooperation with people who had quite a few different ideas than I did and having to negotiate all that. And, you know, as a psychotherapist, I'm helping people negotiate different ideas all the time. So it was a good springboard for a lot of what I do. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and this was just another little question I thought of uh, when you were all talking, because you all talked at some point about, you know, like being like over the book and like putting down pictures and stuff. And you look at so many memories as um, a member of the staff or a member um, or one of the editors. I was just curious as to um, what your favorite Fairfield memory was. Yeah, it's a tough question. <laughs> that, that, that's a big question. I, I saved that question. <laughs> but um, Susan, do you, is there well, one that comes to know, mind? Not one big thing comes to mind. What comes to mind are all the small things. Mm -hmm. You know, the hanging out in the dorm with your friends, the, you know, laughs, the, you know, times when you would, you know, meet somebody, you know, at the cafeteria or something. Um, those are the kinds of things that stick out the most for me. There was one, I, I, something just did come to mind. My roommate and I had a lot of the same classes and she and I would get up early in the morning and go to breakfast. Nobody was there. Then we would study and then go about our day, have our classes, whatever. And then at night, we didn't really do a lot of studying because we had already done it. So we had all these guys that used to come to our room to try to get us to not study because they didn't want us to break the curve of the test that was coming up. And they couldn't figure out how we were doing it because all they saw is we weren't studying. So, you know, uh, at the end of the year, we took great pleasure in sharing our secret with them that we got up early and went to breakfast and did our studying in the morning. Oh, that's, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, is there a memory that comes to mind for you? I think it was a lot of little things as well. Um, you know, one of the traditions that some of my friends and I started was um, a Friendsgiving. And Friendsgiving is like such a big, big thing now, I remember. Um, like, we felt like we started it. I'm sure we didn't. But we also used to watch Friends all the time on TV. It was, you know, on when I was there followed by Will and Grace. So just even little moments like that, watching, you know, TV shows, you know, weekly to, with the same group was, was always really fun or playing Nintendo in my friend's, you know, dorm room, um, just finding out new things about my friends. Um, but the Friendsgiving is something we still do to this day. We have decided this is the first year we have to do a virtual Zoom Friendsgiving. Um, and we're gonna see how that works, but, um, uh, I would say it's, it, yeah, it's really just so many fun moments and not one really stands out more than others. Uh, and I do remember senior week being a blast, but it does, it does not mean that that's going to be your best time at Fairfield, but um, definitely a lot of good memories as you kind of like wrap up everything from your Fairfield experience together and you're all preparing to say goodbye to your, your life and it's, you, you have a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome, thank you. And Julia? Yeah, I would agree. Um, I don't think, you know, there's ever gonna be like one moment. <laughs> um, it's more as, you know, you can, uh, you kind of have this insight as your book ever, editor is that it's not like ever one moment, it's a collection of moments that really make your time um, at Fairfield memorable. Um, and um, I, like I said, you know, I think most importantly for me was like the friendships that I made, the girls that I, you know, started out freshman year with um, on my floor, we all stayed together. Um, you know, sophomore year, we moved to the same dorm floor. You know, eventually, you know, we ended up having a house at the beach together, which was, you know, amazing. Um, and we loved and we had a very close knit group of people that we were friends with. 
um, at the beach who we were neighbors with and we're still friends to this day. <laughs> um, and really, you know, I kind of all those collection of memories together were terrific, but um, yeah, I mean, it's just, I think maybe one of the best memories for me was actually after Fairfield um, was when my husband and I got married and the fact that all these people who we went to school with at Fairfield actually showed up like literally every single one of them um, that we were friends with that we, you know, spent four years with the fact that everybody, you know, took the time to travel and to come and to celebrate it with us. I think that was if I had to pick a moment, that was really, really great for us because that made us feel really great um, to have all those people there with us um, who were so formative for us. So I guess that would be the moment. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you all for sharing your memories. Um, so I know, we, I know have we have a few minutes left, so, so we can open it up and see if anyone who was um, listening in has any questions for any of you. So if anyone has questions, you can you know, if you want, raise your hand. You can throw them in the chat box. You can um, unmute yourself. You can just wait a second and see if anyone has any questions. It's always tough to be that first person to ask a question. <laughs> While you're waiting for a question, I have another story that came to my mind, which was um, uh, I had a calculus professor who uh, did not want Fairfield to go co-ed. And he refused to call us anything other than So, you know, I was uh, kind of a fresh person. So I am his sister. And he got very upset about that. But as a result, we became very good friends. And he finally accepted that there were women at Fairfield. You and uh, Dr. Briginski must have gotten along very well. I We did. We did. She has a very similar <laughs> manner to her. So um, we do have one question from Elise. And she's wondering, do you have a favorite memory or challenge in working on the manor for a particular for your particular year? So, and Elise, correct me if I'm not understanding your question. So, I think what Elise is asking is: is there a moment you can think of where you like it was your favorite like moment working on it? Like something finally clicked, something lo looked great, or something challenging that you had to overcome um, to do, do your yearbook that year? Um, Julia, would you like to go first? Anything come to mind? Sure. Um, um, I mean, thankfully I had the, the, the years prior to kind of work out like some of the kinks. Um, but I think probably the most challenging thing for me in my last year as an editor was actually kind of passing the baton um, and having to train someone to then subsequently take on the role. Um, so making sure that I chose someone who I felt, you know, would be, you know, a good person for the job. And then also making sure that I taught them everything that they needed to know, like what tidbits that I'd learned um, kind of like along the way. Um, thankfully, I had been on the yearbook staff, you know, the three years prior and had actually served as editor the year prior. So I, I was able to get a lot of the kinks out um, before my senior year, um, but really having to pick someone and, you know, teach them how to do the job um, is tough. <laughs> Not as easy as you'd think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Megan? Um, I was just glancing at mine too to see if it made anything stand out. But yeah, I, I feel like a lot of the kinks, like in how to put it together, I had worked out in the other years a little bit. But um, I do remember like feeling relieved that I was staying you know, local, because, you know, you graduate and you're waiting on the graduation pictures to, to put in the yearbook. So I think I finished it up at some point um, early in the summer because I had some, you know, classmates reaching 
reaching out to me, hey, do you know when we're going to get it to your books? And I'm like, oh, well, we just finished it. Like, you know, you, there's a couple things to r- wrap it up, um, you know, even after you graduate. But I would say it was really rewarding when the yearbooks actually started getting delivered and people would, you know, say thank you for doing such a good job and, you know, being happy to see themselves in there and and having everything look good. So it was really rewarding it doing it for your own year um, because people largely knew who you were and um, I, I really appreciated how you wrapped up their four years of college into to a book. So I guess that that's kind of my favorite memory is when it was all done. <laughs> So your favorite memory then was like receiving like, like calls or texts or whatever from people saying they, they got and they were happy with it. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Susan? I'm having a hard time with this one. I, nothing uh, big sticks out for me. Um, I think one of the challenges for the, the yearbooks I did prior to my year was not knowing people. And when it came to doing the, um, uh, you know, looking over the copy after it was all finished before it went to print. Some of the things I couldn't figure out if they were accurate, like the names under the seniors' pictures, because I didn't know who they were. So, and there were a couple of mistakes with that because I didn't know and they mixed them up. And so there are some people who have their picture and somebody else's name underneath it. But I think that's the biggest challenge I found. Mm -hmm. And I guess that kind of leads us into another question Elise had about um, how the change of technology has affected working on the book. Because Susan, you you have a very different experience of working with the book versus, um, I know Caitlin and I, and so um, maybe you can speak to with the, the names, how you would even go about doing that. Well, um, we had to, as I was saying before we got started on this, um, we didn't have any computers. You know, the computer at Fairfield was the size of one of the buildings and all of the um, input was key punch. You know, so we didn't have that technology to work with. So everything was done on paper. Everything was done. You know, you had a photo, you had these little... um, kind of wax sticks that you um, marked the photos with to crop them. Then you had to um, have graph paper to figure out the proportions of the pictures and where you wanted them laid out. It, you know, it was very time consuming and very um, manual. Mm-hmm. So as far as, um, you know, when you got the uh, proofs, you had to make sure that everything was correct before it went to print. Now you would just see it on your screen. But, you know, some mistakes happened because it it was all human. None of it was machine, you know what I mean? And at the time that the proofs would come out, everybody was gone because they'd come out in the summer. So unless you got some of your staff together to look at the proofs together, which I did do, but even that some things slipped under the rug, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Megan and Julia, I know you two are only a few years apart in um, when you graduated. So did you two have a very similar experience with how you created the book? I mean, we, so mine, I graduated 15 years ago and um, luckily we were, you know, using laptops and I think we had a computer, a desktop computer in the office um, that, that we would do all the work from. So not sure how much it's changed from today, but it, you know, was, was pretty modern and, um, you know, pretty easy cropping. And I, I completely forgot about the proofing part of it, but yes, we would. I think in the summer, get those proofs back and, and have to do that part. So I did not have any help with that. <laughs> so, so that was on me. And yeah, you're trying to make sure that you haven't made any major mistakes. Um, especially I hate spelling names wrong. My name's been spelled wrong almost my whole life <laughs> by most people. It's a unique way of spelling. So getting the people's majors in there. But I think at least things were given to me in a pretty organized way with technology, how it is. So um 
I had a lot of it figured out, but, but it's definitely a challenge if you're looking over paper proofs all by yourself, you know, you're, you're bound to miss something, but nobody ever told me I, I messed up anything big that I've heard. Awesome. And Julia, similar experience? Yeah, I mean, ours was all digital. Um, I didn't have to do any, you know, anything by hand in terms of cropping or anything like that. Um, it was, you know, a little bit easier, definitely. I did have to do like the cropping and the graphing paper like back in like middle school and high school when I did the yearbook, but so definitely having the digital version was better. Um, I imagine it's even easier now to do it. Um, I remember we just had the one computer in the office and that was the sole computer we could do the work on. I'm sure now like with things like Google Drive and the cloud and you know VPN and stuff like that, you can work remotely on it and things like that. You don't all have to be on one device which probably makes things a lot easier. Um, I was also the first class where like Facebook was present, like starting our freshman year. So we were like the first class to have Facebook. So we kind of got a little bit of, I don't know, like not so much pushback, but everybody was like, oh, why the heck do we need a yearbook now? Because all of our, like all photos from all four years were all on Facebook. Um, uh, now, obviously there's other social media platforms that, you know, photos are documented on and so forth. So, um, you know, we really had to kind of, you know, I guess sell it a little bit more, I guess, for people to want to buy the book and things like that. Everybody was like, oh, I can just download everything from Facebook. Um, but another thing, the way that made things easier was, you know, we didn't have to have physical photos. Like we started now having digital photos. So that was like the first year we instituted using an app where people could upload their photos to, and it made things really easy for us in terms of obtaining photos from various people. Um, so not just our friend group or harassing people <laughs> in person for photos. So I think, you know, and technology is changing rapidly and I'm sure you guys are experiencing your own set of challenges and perks as a result of technology, but yeah, it can be um, a blessing and a curse. So <laughs> um, yeah, so I can, I can only imagine what you, um, you guys are going through these days with technology and such. <laughs> yeah, um, we're, so you were saying, Julia, and you, you're right, that we don't all have to crowd around one computer to get work done anymore. Um, we actually have a, an online portal where we can all have separate logins and log in and do our pages. And uh, Caitlin and I have a, a Google Doc that we have going with what pages are and who's assigned to the pages. So, you know, that certainly makes it a little smoother. Um, we do still have to hunt people down for photos. So that's still a thing, but yeah. So things have changed. Certainly from Susan, when you were working on the book, it's changed a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we have only a couple minutes left and we have um, one more question and it's um, describe your leadership style as an editor. So yeah, um, Julia, would you like to go first? I don't know what style I have. Um, most of the people on the staff were my friends, so um, which can be, you know, make things easier, but it can also make things challenging. Um, you have to be a little bit more disciplined with them about establishing deadlines and so forth, but they are very helpful. Um, in terms of utilizing them as like your network of people to kind of reach out to to various organizations and other people on campus to get them involved. Um, and I think you kind of just as a, I don't know if this is a style, but you kind of just have to adapt to your staff, you know, and kind of play up each of their strengths to, to help you. Like some of my friends and other members of the staff were like real like social butterflies. So they could go out and <laughs> harass people for things. So I think you're really, my leadership style was, you know, just an overall supervisor and then kind of play up the strengths of my, my colleagues to, to hopefully get the job done. I don't know if that's really a style, but <laughs> what I did and it worked. <laughs> hey, yeah, it, it worked. So <laughs> Susan, do you have uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would call my style democratic. You know, we voted on everything, especially when there was a controversy over, you know, what style or what theme or those kind of issues. 
So, um, you know, I tried to make sure everybody had a voice and when it was not in agreement, we voted. Fantastic, and Megan? Yeah, I would say, you know, it, it was hard sometimes to get other people to focus, you know, they had other responsibilities. Um, now in the real world, with a job, it's a little bit different once you're getting paid for these things that you're doing. But um, so my leadership styles probably evolved, but I was always really organized. So I did, you know, we didn't have it in Google Docs yet, but we probably had a printed out paper or an Excel spreadsheet or something that I kept track of, you know, what are what were all the things to be done and who was going to do it. And by deciding who's going to do it, you know, it wasn't necessarily always even. It was, I, I think it was a bit democratic as well. Like, well, how much do you want to give? You know, what are you interested in doing and let people kind of work on the things they wanted. So definitely we had meetings to, to check on status and, you know, just making sure everybody was happy, I think was always important to me too. Um, so, and, and that we were all kind of making some decisions together, but then, you know, I did feel the need sometimes if people, um, if we couldn't decide on something, they'd kind of look to me and I, I usually felt comfortable making that ultimate decision. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. I know we're just about at time. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you for um, being willing to talk with us about your experience as um, yearbook editors. We really appreciate it. Well, I have a question. Is, is Mr. Fitz still doing the yearbook? Is he still a big part of it? Because I, I think, as I mentioned, when I heard about this, at the same time, I got Fairfield Magazine with him on the cover about retiring. And I was like, this is a sign. <laughs> I yeah. got to talk to the, I got to talk to the manor people. So um, he, he was always so great. <laughs> yeah, he's um, our advisor still. Um, yeah. Yep. He's great. Awesome. We love him. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Tell him to give you an office back before he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to put that on the list, Caitlin. <laughs> he was supposed to retire last year because it was exactly 50 years, but COVID happened and he didn't want to leave everyone in a scramble. So now he's retiring. I think it's February 17th because it's exactly 51 years now. <laughs> so he hasn't changed. <laughs> he may still push it back. I wouldn't be honestly, honest. I know. I don't think he'll ever leave. <laughs> so yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, and have a great rest of your Sunday and enjoy your week. Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Enjoy Fairfield, everybody.